Okay, thanks everyone for coming this afternoon. Uh, I'm James Kennedy. I'm going to be talking to you about for half an hour about um, something that I cooked up for abstractions too. I thought it would be um, a, an interesting thing for me to have to go through and for me to have to talk about. And I uh, look forward to what hearing what people think about it. Um, and yeah, it was fun. Okay, so the idea is that we're going to set ourselves with a challenge. We're going to we're going to um, try to have a uh, by the end of this uh, a, a conceptual under uh, conceptual idea or like draft, let's say, of a workflow where what I want to do is I want to uh, prepare a um, some type of deep learning text-based uh, model and deploy it as an application and think about all those things around workflow and managing software and deploying uh, stuff to the cloud and all of that good stuff. So what are some caveats here? So this is not, not a pro what I would consider like a professional system. So don't run off with this and you know, uh, bet the family farm. Um, but you know, what are we trying to do here really? We're just trying to reduce the time to build this thing, reduce the time to deploy it. We want something that's pretty cheap to play around with. Uh, we want to be conscientious of the resources that we're using because uh, that, that equals both energy and money. And right now there isn't elaborate testing involved in what I'm about to present you. So there was some amount of uh, casual testing, we'll say, but like a really a rigorous testing framework so you really feel confident about what you have here. Not included. Doesn't, not, not standard at this time. Um, so if you have an interest, I see lots of people have computers. Uh, if you go to thatkennedy.net, you'll find these slides. Um, so that should be of reference to you. If you also go there, you'll also get a link to the GitHub page, which has the repository, which we're going to run through. We're going to be running through. OK. So we're going to not really spend a lot of time talking about fast AI. So I have a kind of a slide here that we're not going to look at the slide very much. It's there if you want to learn more about it. There's a lot to learn about. Basically, what's the idea behind Fast AI? Fast AI is like a higher level Python library that sits on type of PyTorch. It's really supposed to be a, um, it's supposed to kind of bake in a lot of best practices around uh, particularly working with computer vision and then as we're talking today, working with natural language text. Um, it has some really great videos. I'm really not going to talk a lot about Fast AI. We're going we're gonna to use Fast AI, uh, Fast, Fast AI to build this thing, but there's a whole lot um, that is available on their MOOC. Uh, really, really good. Um, I really recommend it. And yeah, they're all about, yeah, they're, how do you not like people who have a quote like that, right? So we're not, we're just trying to um, try to make this accessible. So we're going to come back and talk about this again, but this is essentially what we're going to be using today. Um, it's going to, this is like a transfer learning concept. We're going to talk about transfer learning later on with a little bit more graphics. Um, but uh, essentially what we're going to do today is we're going we're to create a language model that's based on Wikipedia text. And when I say language model, I mean this particular thing that we, we, you, people say when they talk about uh, text um, deep learning and a language model is just a, is a model that will predict the next word and will kind of create continue a sentence that's been started for it. So the idea is that we're going to create one of these models that is like a next word predictor with Wikipedia text. We're then going to uh, leverage this same model using IMBD video reviews, movie reviews, and then we're going to use uh, that model to do classification. So yeah, we'll draw lots of interesting parallels to Good stuff that's happened in computer, version, uh, computer vision, but we'll talk about that later. So anyway, a little bit of a foreshadowing. Um, yeah, so I kind of want to set expectations a little bit here, because there are a lot of, we have phones that do all this language stuff all the time, so I'm not trying to stand up in front of you and be like, I'm the, I'm the next Google. You know, this is natural language. We've, um, I've figured it out. Um, but there is this, um, so yeah, to put this in context, for instance, OpenAI, this might be a, a group that people are familiar with. Um, you know, I, uh, they work on all kinds of interesting things. They certainly have worked on natural language. 
types of uh, deep learning applications. So this is, a, this is like a cute little web app that someone uh, built using, uh, on one of their language models. So this would, um, this would be uh, you know, something kind of comparable to what we're going to do. And I have some examples here that we're going to use before so, or use later in this presentation. So like, let's say I took you know, my favorite part was when, and I throw this in here, and I tell it to complete the text. So it's going to start spinning up servers and you know, getting the, um, you know, the elves making cookies and stuff. And uh, what it's going to eventually do is it's going to start uh, just adding uh, you know, random text to this, you know, some words that I randomly, that I randomly gave it. And the, and, the, and the idea is that this is, you know, this is an example of what some people consider, you know, state-of-the-art text generation stuff, you know. Uh, because the idea is that this in itself, it's funny, the keynote at the end of the day is you know, we should build stuff that's not useful. This isn't, you know, this isn't what you want to go bet the family farm on, right? But um, uh, there's a lot of applications that this, this kind of is, this can be foundational to more, complica uh, more complicated things. Um, so yeah, the idea is that this is built on this other model, GPT-2. Um, anyway, lots, lots of text and parameters. It was complicated, guys. It took a lot of work <laughs> to make that happen. Um, so this is going to be, we're going to use this graphic for the rest of the presentation to um, just kind of trigger stuff for us as like what we're going to be using. Um, so I'm going to quickly run through all of the steps, and then we're going to more slowly go through that. But the, basically what you want to imagine is that this down here is your laptop, if it's in the white box, and then everything else up top is a, is a web service. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with our development machine. It's going to have our development environment and some command line terminal, and we're going to have, we're going to, you know, clone this repository, essentially. We're going to um, use um, G Cloud and and or the uh, Google Cloud uh, platform console to set up a project and kind of go through this the, all of this administrative stuff right to say you know me I know you this is a credit card you know give me three hundred dollars free for a year all that kind of stuff so that the develop machine is queued into the project um, we're going to um, deploy a virtual machine that comes pre-installed with PyTorch and actually fast AI and will end up using a, cl a client through the browser to also then um, to basically be the driver to this virtual machine that's going to be where we actually train the fast AI models and where we then push those models uh, to cloud storage where they then are going to be accessed by a build service which is going to create Docker images and then host those images on a container registry. And from that registry, we can just take uh, Docker, these, these image, images, deploy them to Cloud Run, which is basically just a, a very nice service for, um, you know, you can kind of thinking about it as like Lambda, AWS Lambda. This, there's a, it, it's, it's in, except that instead of it being a function as a service, it's just a container as a service. So I don't have to have this thing run all the time. It's very cheap for me at, at start. So let's run through this a little bit more in depth because what we're going to do at the end then is we're going to actually be able to you know, use the web browser to make basic requests to this thing or use Postman uh, to kind of facilitate that process. So this, um, either you're familiar with all these tools and I probably have stuff to learn from you or maybe you're familiar with some, half of these and this is a good introduction to some other things. But um, this, is, this is kind of an example of a relatively uh, perhaps the simplest workflow you could have to do this? I don't know. Something like that. Okay, so uh, where are we going to go? We're going to go um, clone this. Um, we're going to go clone this repository. So as I was mentioning, right, if you go to thatkennedy.net, uh, you'll land on this page, so you'll have the slides. And then you'll also get a couple links down here. So if we go to the GitHub page, let's take a look at what we're signing ourselves up for. All right. Uh, and once again, I apologize, there's a lot more to have been done, but hopefully this will be sufficient for now. Um, just to get us oriented, right, so the idea is that we're going to uh, essentially readme is this tiny sad excuse for a readme document. Um, the makefile will be our main 
um, method for, uh, you know, kind of quarterbacking from our development environment. Um, uh, the lab files includes just an example of notebook that you would then deploy to your virtual machine for training and it includes all the code for training the models and then deploying them to storage so they're accessible to the build service. And then the, the base image is the simplest Docker image in the, or sorry, not the simplest, it's the, um, it's the biggest Docker image because it, it packs up all the Python requirements, it packages up the models from cloud storage so it's pretty beefy and takes a little while to build. The app image is much smaller and just build, basically just extends the base image. So all it does is then just adds an app layer on top of this other um, already defined uh, container definition. So we'd end up um, pulling that in and you know, we would have something essentially that would look like this. Uh, I was fooling around with text sizes, but let's, uh, let's keep fooling around with text sizes with fonts. Bigger? 16? 20? That's good? Okay. okay. So we'll uh, keep charging through this. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time about the Google Cloud stuff because maybe you've already worked with other clouds before and they have little things that are different. But essentially we're authenticate, you know, go, they've got great documentation. You should go authenticate yourself, make a project, you know, here's a great link, you know, step-by-step -step guide, installation and setup. Better than anything, anything that I've written for you today. Um, okay, so let's start up with like really what this next step in the process is. Deploying um, this virtual machine that we're going to do our training on. Um, what I call, uh, in this case, make VM, which really just is like start this machine up if it hasn't been started, which is to contrast deploy, which is this ship has never been launched before. We're launching this ship for the first time. So we're really uh, 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 either creating the virtual machine or just starting it. Make lab is just an SSH command to just say I want to, I'm just going to send Jupyter lab over this uh, particular port and then make stop just shuts it down. So if you want to look at all of those, those are all, um, those are all in the make file here. And they're all really just gcloud commands, right? Because what we're, all we're doing is, you know, make deploy lab is really just this incantation that says, I want to start a computer instance and have all of these, I want it to be big and beefy and in particular have a, um, you know, this particular uh, uh, platform uh, for really this, that they have their own image here that specifically has everything you need for, for fast AI and PyTorch and all of this. Um, so let's actually kick one of these on. Uh, let's see. So I don't, I should have actually, I should have done this before we started the talk. This is also a little bit small, right? I was trying to figure out how to make this bigger, but uh, essentially what we're doing is we're just gonna start up this VM and we'll, we'll kind of keep jumping, jumping in and out as I can uh, give you guys examples of what we're, what we're looking at here. But what I'm gonna, just, just so you can see it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do the v, make VM that's going to kick this thing on. And then I'm going to do make lab. And make lab just is, is essentially an SSH forwarding task. So I now have access to this. this um, how many people have used Jupyter? Because that's what the whole process is. Great. So a lot of people really know about this, which is good. So it'll take a second, and we'll we'll end up looking at what those um, um, end up looking at what those are like. Ooh, not the lab. Okay. So while we wait, wait to make sure that everything's up and running, the basic idea uh, of what we're going to be really using as uh, what I'm going to cover from Fast AI today has to do with saving files and basically the framework for saving uh, not, and not just files but models. So um, learner really is like uh, the the um, the convention that you would call whatever model you're working with in Fast AI. You can use the save or load functions on this object. 
if you're going to end up using this in the same workstation and it has just a default place in its working directory where this file gets saved for this model. Uh, this, is, this is nice if you need to, you want to come back and start training from a particular point. If you want to really e export this thing, you use the export import commands, um, which is what we end up doing. Uh, what we end up doing in these uh, in these notebooks here. Which not that I love showing my notebooks in this IDE, but I will. Well, I'm glad that everyone knows about Jupyter and they'll forgive me for not being able to SSH to it over my uh, cellular phone right now. Um, in the very least, believe me, this Jupyter notebook, right, it does this thing and it, it trust me, it, you can export and load these models and you can export them to, um, you, can use, you can use the bang symbol, right, to use the um, GUtil, uh, Google storage util to export this to the uh, cloud storage. Um, so let's talk, this building process is a little complicated. Um, we've got building the base image, which uh, we're going to use G Cloud Builds, which will be, will be our service. The serv the, so we're, we're not going to do any building on our local development environment. We're going to have Google Cloud do all of our image building for us. So I'm going to submit to Google this Cloud Build YAML file, which defines all of the steps in this process. So. The most important part, or really the real reason why we need to do this, is that I need to copy in these exported models in lines two through five. This is basically defining what's the build environment. Because you can imagine, this is the, this is the complexity. There's so many environments. I've got my laptop environment. I've got my Jupyter VM environment. I've got this environment that's going to actually do the build. And that's what we've got right here. So the build environment is going to get these um, uh, these uh, exported models in from uh, cloud storage into the build environment, and then we're just going to run our we're just going to run Docker on on the particular Docker file uh, file here, and all we're really doing in this case is, as we've said before, just installing the requirements, doing all this heavy lifting, so that every single time we want to change a little something in our app, we don't have to redo all this heavy lifting. We're going to install all of the OS le uh, OS level stuff. We're going to install whatever requirements we have in a requirements file, and then we're going to copy in using just standard Docker language the, these folders that have models in them. Um, and just to see at the top, the the um, the requirements file isn't too crazy. Um, we have um, to use a special version of Fast AI, which we'll talk a little bit more about later if, if we have the time. Um, but this really has to do with that there's a constraint in the natural language portion of fast AI uh, when you only get one CPU, which is a major restriction for most serverless deployments. So we have a, a kind of a customization uh, to the standard fast AI library so we can use it in a serverless deployment. And um, we install PyTorch from a wheel and all of this, uh, these Flask framework stuff that we're going to use to just run this, this API. Uh, okay. So if I was to do something, like I'm, um, hopefully this will work. You can't really see that very well. Um, but what I'm doing in this case is I'm um, calling a build command, not on the base image, but on the app image here. And the app image is even simpler, right? Because um, all I needed, all I'm doing here is I'm, we already built this base image, which has all the requirements in it. So all we really need to do here is uh, is it, uh, uh, call from that build image, which has been already built for us. It includes 
all of the requirements, copy in what our demo um, Python app is in this case, and call the uh, goonicorn command or a uh, uh, juni, uh, junicorn um, to launch it. And what that image, what that um, that application looks like, once again, uh, is being built using Flask. So if, if a lot of people have used Jupyter, I'm sure you're familiar with Flask. Um, one of the um, more convenient aspects of this is we'll use Flask RESTful to um, kind of manage some of the um, different resources that you'd have in an API. And it's interesting, coming from using AWS um, Lambda, for instance, in AWS Lambda, what you end up doing is you end up having all of these functions that you define and deploy as functions, and then you have to configure this API gateway as kind of this separate resource. Well, in this case, what you get to do is you get to have like one Flask application and set up all your different resources in this one file. So, you're, so in some ways, you, you lose that, that structure of having API gateway as being this, this um, kind of uh, whole service that you get to configure however you want. But uh, in, in some ways, it's a lot less complicated here. You know, we kind of have a, uh, we're, we're directly creating this, uh, because it's a container level, I'm managing it at a container level. I'm not handing over a function in the same way that you do when you do uh, with Lambda, AWS Lambda. Um, so yeah, so you can, now we can, we've made this app or we've made this image down here. Um, and just to kind of cover it quickly, essentially what it, what it did was, this was the, um, this was just the app image that we did. It pulled in the old, it pulled in the older version of the base image. You can't see this here, but base SLM, it pulls the old image in um, and uh, install, uh, copies in the main um, and just says we're going to start the, the server. So we'll set this up. Uh, it's pretty, it, it's, this is actually a beta version of a, of a Google service. So this is a relatively new framework that Google's put out. Um, so you can see I actually have to use beta in my incantation here. Um, so yeah, how many people have used Cloud Run? Google Cloud Run. Yeah. So yeah, there, there definitely are, uh, it's uh, some things to think about. But it's uh, definitely been interesting to work with. So the nice thing is that right away what it'll do is it'll take this um, take this container that I told it to deploy. It'll create a, an endpoint with that associated with it. Uh, this might t take a little bit of a while because sometimes after a new deployment, all of this yada yada. Um, but essentially, what we have now is the ability to really, you know, have something very comparable to what this this guy did. I mean, it's not it's not going to be nearly as pretty. Um, so while that gets set up, let's run through a little bit what's happening with the classific what we're going to do with classification here. So this particular um, model that we're going to use is built on ULM fit, uh, which was really led by Jeremy Howard, who is one of the guys, one of the you know main um, drivers behind uh, fast AI. Um, as we were talking about this before, one of the differences between kind of traditional machine learning and what we're going to be doing in this case really is that um, in traditional ML, you kind of have a task that you train to, and you have a task that you train to, and that if these, you, you kind of approach each task as if you've never done anything else before. And that obviously this is not, you know, there's opportunity here to say, okay, well, we have some algorithm here that, you know, uh, was developed or some, some, you know, set of weights or encodings or embeddings that was maybe, um, took a long time to develop that when applied to this, this other task is, might be useful. And so for any of you that went to the computer vision talk, I think it was at 2 o'clock or something like this, he talked about how you do this two-step thing, right, where you have these layers, right, where you, you know, people don't, people don't really train vision models like right from the 
like from scratch if they're doing classification, they'll build it on ResNet or something like this, right? And the, the whole idea here is that it's like, oh, look, we're, you know, some of these, we can, we can stop at some um, kind of intermediate uh, place in this process. We built some model here that's all about identifying where a face is in a photo, and now I'm going to use that same model to now just identify and classify uh, faces. I'm going to build upon this original application to kind of do something completely different. Um, and that's, it's kind of a similar idea to what you're doing in Fast AI with, the, with this, this concept called the encoder. And um, this really is, this, this is really the, the interface between the language model model, which is just the model that rants, with the model that is used to classify text. And so in the example that we'll have today, we'll have the, the example be whether or not it was a, uh, a good review or a bad review. So this is an example of um, what gets the gibberish that comes out when you go to the root resource, right, on this application. I have it just printing out uh, all the same text that starts with my favorite part was when, and then it just creates, creates gibberish after this point. So it does this five times for a certain number of words. You can see it's all really related to movies, right? I mean, it's definitely the IMBD data set that was behind this thing. Um, and you can, you know, re-trigger this. You know, I can just refresh this page. And the beautiful thing about this is that if you end up, if you, you could definitely, um, it's kind of the right application for serverless, if, you know, at least as a toy, right? Like you certainly don't want to be hosting this indefinitely. It would be like the real point. Like you don't, you don't want to have to have this be up all the time. Um, and what we can, um, please feel free to read all this, it's good. Um, what we can end up doing is actually using Postman to kind of show the additional capabilities of this. So how many people have used Postman? Great. So we'll just, uh, you know, so this is the, this is be an example also on the root resource. Um, so we're not doing anything, we're not passing any parameters or anything like this. And yeah, we get a whole bunch of, whole bunch of text here. Um, we could also, for instance, this would be an example of what we're going to do is we're going to have it, uh, I can pass a parameter to this, uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this model, have it say stuff for me, right? So we're still in gibberish land. Um, but, you know, this would be, you know, this, this now shows like you have some capability, you know, you can, you can make it customizable. Or we can say something else, like what does someone want to say? We can have this IMBD thing talk for us. Excellent. Let's see. <laughs> the best thing you've ever read before, I'm sure. Um, so the real power, once again, is that like not necessarily in the gibberish, right? So the real the and I don't know if there's really much value in this either, but it certainly is more of an example, right? So this is this would be uh, I don't know if people have noticed this, but there. Um, so the first thing is that I was able to uh, route this. Um, application to a custom URL, and instead of going right to the root, we're going to go to a, a, an RC resource, which is just going to be review classification. So now we're sending a particular request. In this case, I can set different reviews. Uh, so if I say, don't waste your time, um, you know, being like the review text, right? It now, this particular model has been trained not just to predict what the next word is, it's, it's seen all of this language associated with movie reviews and whether or not it was positive or negative, right? So it, it's been trained as a classifier to, you know, it saw what, what was, we, you know, what humans labeled as good and what was labeled as bad reviews. Um, and in this case, the first number suggests the probability or the confidence that it's a bad, you know, this, this is someone who doesn't like the movie versus what someone might, might, might like it. So if we were to go, and say, like, I love the first part one. You know, that would be, you know, 98% confident. Oh, yeah, these guys really definitely like the movie. So still a toy example. Um, thanks for sticking through it with me and seeing it through. I'm, I apologize that Jupiter didn't work. I'm glad a lot of people have seen it. So it's not like we missed out on something earth shattering. Um, and essentially, what are the takeaways? We can, you know, get it, we, we want to go from our Jupyter deployment to some cloud storage. So we're not pulling anything, we're not pulling any big data local to do builds. 
We're going to do all our builds remotely, ideally, you know, close to where we were doing our training, and that we want to end up serving this service. We don't need a GPU to, GPU to do it. We want to think about what that deployment needs to be on its own and in an isolated manner. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I have some closing, more, more closing notes, but I'll, uh, I'll just stop there and, yeah, you can look it up online, right? So, uh, but yeah, there were all those, uh, those little things you had to do to make it work, so um, thank you.